happy. Let's pray God's blessing on our time together, shall we? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the morning. Thank you for this place, this beautiful place we have to worship and pray and honor you. May you be glorified this morning with this message. May all our friends, our brothers and sisters here be moved to be doers of the word this morning as we reflect on our conversion experience, as we reflect on the Apostle Paul's suffering for Christ. Thank you for the message. May you move in a powerful way in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep our senior pastor and his family in prayer. August is the annual time that they take time away as a family to remember and celebrate the life of Nicole. So we love for him to have that time. We pray that you'd be joining us as we pray that it be a time of refreshment for him. And Pastor Matthew and I will work to hold down the fort. And uh, just to give you a preview, so I will have the next two weeks Matthew will have his Sunday nights. This Wednesday, we have a guest pastor, Calvary pastor will be with us. You won't want to miss it, Wednesday. And then the following Wednesday, I will wrap up a series I'm calling The Life of Paul. So we are uh, excited to be here. And uh, Pastor Matthew and I, thank you so much for supporting our senior pastor this time off. The title of my message is Right Place, Right Time. Right Place, Right Time. It's in the book of Acts. We'll get to the text uh, shortly. I thought about this in light of being a sports fan, of course, and I found a story, an Olympic sports story that fit into this. It's been a while, most of you may not remember, but there was once, there was an Olympics in Salt Lake City, Winter Olympics, short speed skating, and the reason I thought about it was because there was an American named Apollo Ono that was picked to win virtually every race. And he was competing in the finals, among other people, a man named Stephen Bradbury. Now, Stephen was from Australia. It's like 104 degrees in his hometown. He was competing against people from Sweden and Norway and the U.S. and was picked to be last. Quite frankly, it was amazing he was even in the finals. But Stephen's claim to fame was he built speed skates for a living. Paulo wore those skates. So he asked Apollo before the race, hey, when you win, can you please mention that you wore my skates? Help me with my business. And I don't know if Apollo agreed, but the way the story goes in the finals on the last lap of that race, Stephen was last and everybody else crashed into each other on one of the final turns, only to allow Stephen to just cruise to the win. From last to first. Now that was right place, right time. So he told Apollo, don't worry about the interview. I'm going to tell everybody about my skates. He went on to have a successful career building them in Australia. Great story. But then 2,000 years ago, another story. Right place, right time. It's about the story of a Philippian jailer we're going to talk about this morning. Right place, right time, because the last thing this Philippian jailer had in mind was to give his life to Christ. But Christ, like always, had other plans. Paul was on his second missionary journey with Silas. The Bible tells us they came upon the city of Philippi. This was a Roman colony now. So most likely, as we hear this story, this jailer was probably a retired Roman guard, which many stayed in Philippi. It was a comfortable city in Macedonia. Why leave after they were no longer needed in the Roman army? So most of them would guard the prison. But in verse 16, as we go back before the text, we're going to start in, in verse 22 this morning. Verse 16 says, we, not they, not Paul and Silas, but we, so we know now that the author, Luke, a physician, was along for this ride. Otherwise, why would he write it as we? Pretty unusual. You read through the scriptures to see it written that way. Not so often is the author of the text along as a scribe, so to speak. It's an important part, something we'll talk about in a bit. Verses 17 and 18, we're told they came upon a fortune-telling woman in Philippi, 
she irritated Paul. She followed him around for days. She was an irritation. Kind of gave me an excuse to feel better about being irritable sometimes. Also, Paul got irritable. No excuse, but at the moment, it made me feel better. So what did Paul do? He got so annoyed that he cast the demon out of her. Powerful. Now, that might have worked for Paul, but it didn't work for her owners. She was a fortune teller. She was making money for someone. They weren't happy about it. So they had him arrested, him and Silas, and dragged him down to the city leaders. So I want us to focus on a couple things this morning. One is our conversion experience, because we're going to hear about the conversion experience of this jailer. You might be a Philippian jailer. You might be sharing your faith with Philippian jailers, and you just never know when the right place and the right time for the person you're sharing with is going to come upon them. So here we have these owners, they're unhappy, and the other thing we're going to talk about is the theme of this chapter, Paul and Silas's response to suffering. Their response to suffering, they were falsely accused, drafted before the chief magistrates, crowd rises up against them, tears their robes, they're beaten with rods as thick as a man's thumb, thrown in prison where they meet the jailer. So think about your conversion. Consider what we can learn about the suffering for Christ. And we'll pick up the story this morning in chapter 16, starting in verse 22. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened. Everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he baptized, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. It's an amazing scene, really. What is it that God wants from us? What is Paul saying here? Well, I think to begin with, he's saying, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. You know, discouragement often comes with troubles. We all have troubles. The Bible promises us troubles. Discouragement sometimes comes with it. And if we're not careful, a discouraged heart, we will find, does not respond as God desires. There's a lot for us to learn in these verses. We need to take hold of these things. Because the way we respond to trials is an indication of our maturity in Christ. We all struggle sometimes with how we respond to troubles. Someone once said that people are like tea bags. I'll let that sink in. People are like tea bags. The true flavor comes out only when they're in hot water. It's really true, isn't it? People find out what we're all about when we are in hot water. Our best and our worst comes out. One of my favorite authors, Dr. Paul David Tripp writes books about what comes out of our mouth 
is really only a condition of what's in our heart at the time. Ponder that. We need this understanding about ourselves so we can make changes. We need this understanding. As we read about Paul and Silas, they were put in the inner cell, verse 24 says. I liken that to like maximum security. I'm sure the whole prison was an awful place. The inner cell was more secure, maybe. And now Philippi, you can actually visit this jail cell. So once again, the critics are wrong. Archaeological data, this cell has been found, been uncovered. You could go there and visit. Amazing, but really not. We know it's all true. It's amazing they found it so they could show it to us. It says their feet were fastened into stocks. Now, if you read about how the Romans would fasten one into prison, this was meant to be the most uncomfortable position. You don't think they were just tied to a rope and left to be comfortable. No, their feet were spread about as wide as they could be, set in stocks. Their arms were above their head in shackles. Their backs were against the wall, so the open wounds would rub against the cement. You get the picture. And they probably had the worst cramps they've ever had and could do nothing about it. Like when I jump out of bed at night and scare my wife with cramps. Any of us have those? We got a lot more laughs in the second service than the first service. I bet I've got emails for uh, solutions to that already. An awful place, this prison, awful. And it says in verse 25, at midnight, they were praying and singing hymns to God. Now, I'm sure that you and I, in this pain, in this position, bleeding, that's what we'd do. We would sing hymns and pray to God. Now, I'm trying to imagine what that conversation must have been like between Paul and Silas. Paul, being such a direct and powerful apostle, was not going to be silent, and he was not going to be disobedient to his Lord. He wasn't sulking or complaining, but singing. Paul was praising God. Every single prisoner was awake. I would imagine it was quite a scene. I tried to imagine what might they be singing. Thought about the times. Jeremiah gives us the psalm, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Written in Lamentations during very dark times. I believe that may have been something they were singing. Imagine the scene. Lamentations 321 through 24 says, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. What a great verse to put in our phones, perhaps, when we go through struggles to relate to this scene. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. I have hope in him. So we're not surprised that they're going through troubles. The Bible's filled with stories, filled with promises of troubles. We all have them, right? We're not surprised by that. But Jesus himself said in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. We're also not surprised they're suffering. We're not surprised at all. Jesus also said to us in John 15, 20, remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. What really surprises us about this story is how they respond to the suffering. It surprises me, maybe not so much for Paul, but it does. Every time I read one of these stories, when I relate it personally, we don't always respond so well to troubles. They responded with prayer and singing. Life has a way of beating us up, doesn't it? How do we respond to that? And from that story, we move into the jailer's story right in front of us, starting in verse 26. 
and it talks about a violent earthquake. Luke is writing this. He's witnessing a violent earthquake. Doors flew open. Chains came loose. This wasn't luck. It wasn't fate. It wasn't a coincidence. I submit to you this was a living God answering the prayers of his people. Amen? The critics don't agree, but who cares? They're wrong. Critics are wrong. So the jailer awoke, our, our friend, the Philippian jailer. He awakes and draws his sword to kill himself. Why would he do that? Well, it's why I believe he was a retired Roman soldier. Because when the Roman soldiers were put in charge of prisoners, if they allowed one to escape, they were executed. So in his mind, we had an earthquake, everything came apart, that surely all the prisoners have left, I might as well just kill myself. And Paul says, no, don't harm yourself, we are all here. So we know that Philippi is part of the Roman colony, most likely a place for many of these soldiers to retire. This was the last thing this jailer needed. He knew the risks. He knew the risks. If he lost a prisoner, he would be killed. It's captured for us in Acts 12, verse 19. When Herod had searched for him and had not found him, he examined the guards and ordered that they be led away to execution. Tough job. So the Philippian jailer figured that they were gone and I might as well kill myself. So why would all these prisoners, I tried to imagine, I can't say I know very many to ask, why would they stay? They had freedom. The walls were down, the shackles were off, the stocks were off. Why would they stay? Well, here's my theory. If you're there and you hear someone praying like Paul and Silas, followed by an earthquake, followed by the chains and the doors coming down, think about it. I think I might hang out. Say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm hanging out with Paul and Silas. Prisoners stayed to see what was next. They decided to wait. So their suffering led to freedom. In what way? Paul and Silas were now able to have a powerful witness to all these prisoners through their suffering. Powerful. Philippian jailer was just one of those. And I think about that scene and I think, I get all bent out of shape if I lose my phone. My phone. It disrupt my whole day. How about your wallet? Your keys? How many of you have teenagers that when they lost their keys, they say, Dad, where's my keys? I'm not responsible for your keys. I hear whispers in this testimony happening. So what's the lesson here for us? The lesson is praise, not complaining, pleases God. Praise, not complaining, pleases God. Complaining is common response to problems, but it's not very helpful, is it? It's just not very helpful. Where does it come from? I submit to you that it comes from an attitude that represents our immaturity and, and our faith, our lack of faith. We sometimes think if we harass God enough, he'll change his mind. He'll help us out. How's that working for you? Has not worked well for me. Some people have this attitude. It's interesting that Paul wrote to the same church in Philippi before. We read about it in Philippians chapter two. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, holding fast the word of life. Clearly in this story, we learn God will respond to his people. That's what he's doing for Paul and Silas, responding to his people. He responds to you and I. This guy was a tough guy, this Roman soldier, but yet we read a part of his life where he fell to his knees in fear. And even more amazing in that, in that is how he addressed Paul and Silas. He went from the guard to serves, serves. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? 
Now, the critics often say this event never happened. It was exaggerated, that Luke just blew it all out of proportion. But I submit otherwise. One, the jailer was there. Story is captured accurately by Luke. He didn't see it that way. He didn't, he's not going to trust the 20th or 21st century critics. The walls really came down. You can go visit. And what about Luke? He was along as a scribe, writing. He might not have been in prison, but he certainly witnessed the storm. He saw the results of it. Luke was there. The jailer was in the right place at the right time. How did Paul answer him? Sir. What must I do? Paul was very clear. You don't need to do anything. It's already been done for you on the cross. Amen? Been done for you and for me. It's already happened. How's your memory bank on your conversion? I asked you in the beginning. Think about your own conversion experience through this lesson. Some of us didn't have an earthquake experience. I didn't have an earthquake experience. I was alone with the word of God, given verses by people that cared about me and simply came to the conclusion that it was true and right and that I could no longer do this on my own and came to know the Lord Jesus in college quietly. It's just as powerful in my life. Doesn't have to be an earthquake experience. In essence, Paul is saying, put your personal trust in Jesus who has already done what was needed to be done. Believe. And if you're sitting here this morning and haven't done that, it's as simple as that. A process of believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin, and asking him to help you do what you simply cannot do. The burden is too great. Now, I have an illustration. I believe that Pastor Matthew and I, or Pastor Rich and I, have encountered this. I bet you have encountered this sometimes. I've come across friends that have been separated over time. People move away. They fall away from their faith, whatever, fill in the blank and say to me, I want to come to your church. I need some religion back in my life. And I kind of pause like that and I would say, we don't do religion at Calvary Chapel. So you might want a different church. I say religion equals rules and regulations that suggest people are working their way back into God's graces. At Calvary, we teach about a personal connection, a personal relationship to Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what we have here. If that's what you're looking for, we can help you. Come on. Some have looked at me a little strange. That's okay. They're a Philippian jailer in my life at the moment. Still have a responsibility to share with them. Who are the Philippian jailers in your life? You take the opportunity to share something with them. They may cast it aside for now. But the Lord's word never returns void, does it? So they were looking for something to do, these people that asked me about coming and visiting our church, just like a Philippian jailer. Acts 16, 31 makes it so clear, the answer. How to get eternal life, how to secure a spot in heaven, how to have a personal relationship with God. What did Paul say? How does one become a believer? He says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now one comment on household. It was not uncommon in Roman times for an entire household to come to know the Lord. This was not Paul saying that through the jailer, his household could become Christians. He was offering the household the same offer that he offered the jailer. And they went into the house, and it just so happened, as it did often during these times, the entire household came to know Jesus. That's not the way it happened in my household. How about yours? Oh, the whole household was baptized. The whole household came to know Christ. What an amazing scene. Some of us have prayed for years for family members to come to know Christ, haven't we? Years. So are you like the Philippian jailer today? Do you hear these words and cast them aside? I just pray that one day somebody will share just enough with you. You'll do just enough research that you too will fall on your knees and say, what must I do? And just like Paul says, you don't have to do anything. Believe. You will not earn your way to eternal life. 
What's our place in this story? Well, at first, I think it's our place is to trust that God has a plan for us, trust that he has a plan for us. Paul and Silas were trusting him. They're singing in the prison in pain. They were trusting him. I don't know that they asked him for an earthquake. He just answered the call of his people. That's how God decided to move. And then we see the heart and conversion of the jailer, very powerful in the scene. He wants, to use, he wants us to allow God to use believers. He wants us to allow us, you and me. God uses us. He uses believers to advance the kingdom. He will use the faith that you have to touch others. Don't stop sharing your faith. You never know when what you share will be the right thing, the right place at the right time. You'll, you just never know. You never know. And verse 25 makes that point of telling us that Paul and Silas were praying and singing and the prisoners were watching. They were listening. They couldn't see him. They didn't stop praising God. They knew people were hearing them. In a similar way, the jailer's heart began to soften. And of course, in fear, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Our faith has a direct impact on others. Don't think for a minute it's just all about you and your comfortable life. It's not. He wants us to be uncomfortable. He wants us to share. We are his ambassadors. He uses us to advance his kingdom. Amen. Children, grandchildren are watching us. Coworkers, you fill in the blank. People watch us when we go through troubles. They want to see how we respond. And how we respond may very well be the right place, right time for them may change their life. We need to simply wait on the Lord. Now, I came across a pastor friend on the East Coast when I joined staff here. And he's from a so-called megachurch. I'm not sure what that means today, but that's what they would call it, I guess, back East. And he said to me, people don't understand the word saved. Maybe we shouldn't use it so much. I was shocked shocked. My response was, well, if a lifeguard saves, don't we get that? You get that, right? What if a firefighter runs into a burning building? Happens all the time. Medical calls happens all the time in this town. We understand what it means when they go and they help save lives. How much more do we understand that when the Lord Jesus Christ is on the cross, he was there to save us and provide us eternal life. We should never stop using that term, amen? Haven't had a conversation with him since. It was just a really odd thing. God wants to bless and pour out his favor on us. We understand what it means to be saved. Unlike the jailer, we really in this day cannot say, what must I do? We know, we know. There's many here today that would love to pray with you if you don't know. God will transform us. He will transform us. This is my last point of the lesson. Why did he phrase the question this way, the jailer? How would he know? He wasn't a religious man. He wasn't a theologian. How would he know to say, what must I do to be saved? Well, I believe he was listening. I think other people were, he was a jailer, of course. He wasn't interested in being saved, but he saw what was going on with the demonized girl in town. He was aware of what was going on. He might have been guarding the prison, but I'm sure he was also guarding in the city of Philippi. He heard conversations about Paul and Silas offering salvation to others. He heard it. He discounted. He wasn't interested. He saw the demon-possessed woman have it cast out by Paul. He saw all this. I think he just passed on and kept to his own business until Paul and Silas were arrested and thrown in prison then they became his business. So when this storm came and the shackles flew off and the walls came down, I guarantee he remembered some of these things. As people do when you share your faith. May not be today, may not be tomorrow, but someday they're gonna remember something you said to them and it may be just the thing for them to be in the right place at the right time. Don't be discouraged. Don't lose hope when people cast it aside. People cast Jesus aside all the time. Press on, press on. We can learn a lot 
from this jailer. Sherry and her sister spoke to their dad about salvation for 40 years. Prayed with him, for him. And at the age of 95, one morning he sat up in bed and said, I'm ready. They were shocked. What do you mean, dad? I'm ready. Been talking to him for 40 years. He said, I'm ready, more clear than he said a lot of things. I'm ready. I'm ready to meet my maker. Might have been his exact words at 95. So there in a room in Atlanta, one of her sisters prayed with him, made sure he had a clear mind to understand what he was saying. And oh my, our family claimed that. And you know this, my, my family story, some of you. My oldest son at 33, my oldest son, the last to accept Jesus of my seven. My oldest son on a trip one time said to me, it's time. I can no longer do this on my own. I'm ready. Oh my, you ask my wife and you'll see the tears stream at 33. Powerful, you never know. God's word doesn't return void, amen? So we know how God might work. We just never know how he's going to use us. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Keep sharing your faith. Someone's right place, right time might depend on it. What a special thing for you to be a part of. But be careful. We have to be careful not to orchestrate God's timing on this. Remember, the harvest is his. We are only responsible to be representing him for the gospel. The harvest is his. Might be right around the corner an opportunity for you awaits to share with someone. It'll be their right place and right time. What an honor it would be to influence lives, amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, today might be the right place, right time for someone here. It is already for all of us to be reminded of our conversion experience, the powerful new life that you gave us, the boldness some of us will remember during those early days. And Lord, I pray that we would rediscover that. We would not pass an opportunity to share life with someone. We don't have to press into them. We can love on them and speak the truth. And Lord, perhaps someday they will find they're in a situation like maybe today. It could be the right place, right time for them. Lord, we thank you for the powerful testimony of Paul and Silas. Oh, what an amazing group of men you give us to read about. And Lord, the power of you moving on that prison and causing this jailer's family, his entire family to come to know you. May we experience those types of things in our life, but we, may we always know that you're moving even if we don't see the results of what we share. So Father, we're gonna take communion this morning to remember you. We're so thankful for that. What a perfect opportunity to be reminded in the scriptures to do this always in remembrance of you. So the ushers are gonna come and pass out the elements and we're gonna hold them and take them as a family as Pastor Matthew comes. And Lord, we just pray your anointing on this time. It's a holy moment. And may we reflect on our conversion experience and thanks to you. And Father, if our friends here today that do not know you, I pray they will seek out someone in prayer. Just pray with them. Answer questions, perhaps. This is their right place right time we pray that for them so lord thank you for the worship thank you for the communion thank you for jesus and all god's people